Dear friends, uh, wholeheartedly welcome to this uh, session uh, to talk about integrated mental health, the way forward, and to find the new uh, ways how to improve pe people's uh, mental and physical well-being. I won't uh, open up the cascade, uh, nor the box of the Pandoras. I'll just leave it. Uh, I leave it uh, uh, for our speakers to do, who are actually specialists in the area, what are the possibilities. But let's look at it uh, from the other side of the coin. And that is that the mental health issues are increasing in Europe and globally. Of course, the COVID-19 is one part of it, but certainly there are some other elements and elements in the way of our living that increases the challenges for mental well-being. The mental illness, especially the anxiety disorder and depression, are the leading cause for early retirement. So it is not, not uh, some physical conditions. And actually, it is the leading cause of death for young people. And it is alarming how high the uh, rates of suicides are among the young people. And then again, let's take into account the fact that the COVID-19 has been extremely uh, difficult period for our youngsters. But be it this or that, I think that this is something what we need to tackle as a very important part of EU's health policies. Yes, well, the Commission, as you know, has promised its uh, mental health strategy to come up this year, and this is part of the preparation of this strategy, what we are having right now. And last but not least, uh, I guess I shouldn't be saying this because you know it uh, by heart and yourself. Uh, uh, antidepressants are extremely ineffective and with a lot of side effects. In some other cases, probably most of that stuff would have been forbidden, uh, being dangerous for the, for the patients. And if we think it is less than one third that gets effective outcome of that medication, that is pretty poor figure. Uh, usually to get um, the effectiveness, you know, the patient need to try at least three different medications. And even when you write to find the right medication, you probably need to be eating it for quite some time and the side effects are uh, substantial. So we have all the reasons to see what the integrative mental health, the newest knowledge and other types of approaches can and could give to our mental health and our mental health uh, patients. With these words on my behalf, wholeheartedly welcome and now I will turn the floor to you. Thank you very much. And I'm, yeah, maybe it's a good idea to work with the micro. I'm happy to be here today. And um, I have to say that I have to start with the word unfortunately. Unfortunately, the mental illness is one of the pandemics of the 21st century and a global challenge. According to the WHO, Europe, nearly 125 million people in the WHO European regions were already living with mental illness even before the COVID-19 pandemic. And no wonder, since the pandemic, mental health problems increased the rates of already common conditions such as depression and anxiety by more than 25% and even doubled among young people. Sirpa mentioned it already. Um, and I just spoke a few minutes ago about the problem of children mental health, which is affected the crisis, like the COVID-19 crisis or the climate crisis, are um, yeah, um, making the problems worth regarding ch children mental health. So this is definitely something that needs to be tackled. But why are we here today? Why do we have this event today? 
because there are several deficiencies in the current treatment approach with limited capacity, inequality in service delivery, and adverse effects of widely used medicines. Moreover, the current model of mental health care is focused mostly on symptoms reduction, and it seems that decades of biological research haven't improved diagnosis or treatment. Therefore, we should also address the social and environmental factors that contribute to mental health problems, our everyday lives, our families, our school and workplaces. And addressing mental health is crucial for the overall well-being, as it is closely connected with physical health. In fact, there can be no health without mental health. And hearing today the experts, we will learn that we need a change in the paradigm and practices of mental health care, including fundamental reforms in education, clinical training, and research priorities. We need a different approach towards treatment by creating an ecosystem of collaborative public mental health care. We need to shift from an only disease care system to a holistic health care system, meaning a more person-centered care focused on prevention, resilience, mental health promotion, and health literacy, on empowerment and safe reliance of European citizens. Here, complementary and integrative medicine can play an essential role next to the medical treatment. And let me underline that this is not about the one or the other, but these go together. There is a growing scientific evidence demonstrating the positive effects on mental health by improving the daily management of mental illnesses and building up mental and physical resilience. So lifestyle interventions like healthy nutrition, exercise, relaxation, sound sleep, mind-body practices such as mindfulness or yoga training should be wider known and accessible to more and more people also in order to work on prevention, which is essential. Researchers have shown that 55% of the patients that followed an integrative therapy felt improvements in their depression and anxiety symptoms. I'm sure that the experts today will tell us more about this. Last but not least, nowadays, more research and investment is needed to enhance understanding of resilience factors that protect an individual from developing physical and emotional illness in the face of stress and other pathogenic factors. We need also more research to identify optimal strategies in developing resilience within healthcare and to identify social factors that can be modified to support resilience to promote public health. So many thanks, and I'm looking very much forward to the discussions and the presentations. And I already have to say that I'm very, very sorry, but I can't stay for the whole event. Um, but I'm nevertheless very glad to be here. Thank you very much. Now I will hand over to the European Commission. We're very glad that we have Mrs. Veronique Wasbauer here. She is Principal Advisor for Non-Communicable Diseases from the DG for Health and Food Safety. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Manuela. Uh, honorable members, uh, dear participants, uh, as for the mental health crisis, we all know that the COVID-19 pandemic had already made the situation uh, difficult. And here in Europe, worries about the climate crisis, as you mentioned, uh, the rise in living costs and the war in Ukraine uh, have made it even worse. Last December's Health at a Glance uh, report revealed that half of all young Europeans had reported unmet mental health needs, and depression among young people had more than doubled. The Commission decided to make mental health uh, our top priority, and we must take concerted action. So I thank you uh, for uh, bringing us together uh, today. The many testimonies Commissioner Kyriakides has heard from members of the European Parliament and NGOs 
uh, including recently at the even on a comprehensive mental health approach held on the 21st of March in this European Parliament, show how concerted action is both necessary and possible. They add to President von der Leyen's announcement of a new initiative on mental health to recommendations from citizens at the Conference on the Future of Europe and to the European Parliament's repeated calls for, to step up action on mental health. We have solid foundation uh, to build on. The Commission has developed and implemented many initiatives on funding opportunities over the past 25 years. The web-based EU Compass for Action on Mental Health and Wellbeing to collect best practices on analysed information is one example. In December 2021, we launched, we launched the major Healthier Together initiative with one of its five strong specifically covering mental health. Co-created with national authorities and stakeholders, it had dedicated financial support from the EU for Health programme. Over the last three years, EU for Health has provided over 30 million euros in support for mental health. Its 2023 work programme makes over 18 million available to member states and stakeholders to support the transition towards a more comprehensive approach to mental health in the EU. Vulnerable groups, including cancer, including cancer patients and displaced people from Ukraine, will be among those receiving support. Funding is also provided through other channels, such as the EU Research Programme and the Recovery and Resilience Facility, which to date has disbursed about 50 billion euros for health-related projects. In all, support for comprehensive, prevention-oriented action at EU level is building across the board. Accordingly, the Commission is putting together a communication on a comprehensive approach to mental health due for adoption in June to support and complement action at member state and regional level. We are discussing this approach with member states, stakeholders, and also internally within the Commission. So the consultation process is about member states, which are consulted in the expert group on public health, in particular its new subgroup dedicated to mental health. It's important to uh, underline that member states strongly back EU action. They are interesting, interested in promoting good mental health, preventing mental health problems, and improving access to treatment and care. Stakeholders and citizens have had their say in a recent four-week call for evidence. The call elicited 313 responses from 22 member states and six non-EU countries. Respondents broadly supported the comprehensive approach, focusing on a range of aspects. Better promotion and prevention, skills development through training, education and awareness raising, including destigmatization, improved and equal access to care, health at work, as you mentioned already, including burnout, on social and environmental determinants. In addition, we have gathered a stakeholder's views via a thematic network on mental health in all policies and recent initiatives like the Youth Cancer Survivors Conference and the Youth Policy Dialogue on Mental Health. 
We have also organized large targeted seminar with uh, stakeholders. The next webinars will take place on the 21st of April. Discussions are also ongoing with all relevant commission departments to identify actions and flagships for the communication. Our focus uh, for mental health is primarily on supporting vulnerable groups, including children and young people, and socioeconomically and disadvantaged groups. We will also continue providing financial support to member states and stakeholders. In parallel, we have launched projects with the WHO and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, offering technical assistance and capacity building for member states to transfer and roll out best practices on mental health. With this in mind, we have drawn up a survey with the World Health Organization to assess the capacity of national mental health systems. Its findings will form the basis for tailored support for each individual member states. Also, a major funding project has been launched with the Red Cross to support the mental health of displaced Ukrainian people. For sure, the European Parliament has been a key player in helping us move towards a more comprehensive approach to mental health. The views and input we have already received from members of the European Parliament have been most welcome. They will help further refine the communication on a comprehensive approach to mental health. That comprehensive approach needs comprehensive support. I therefore look at you to support the actions on mental health, leading to better prevention, promotion, and access to treatment and care for all Europeans. If we plan and act together, we can bring about positive change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Veronique, uh, for laying the stage for us, uh, what the Commission is doing and on, on what uh, uh, action has been taken already. And it's quite an impressive start. And I would suggest that we hear first of our speakers and then have the general discussion, if that is okay to you. But uh, if you would have an acute question for clarification or something like that, please go ahead. If not, then we'll uh, move to our next uh, speaker uh, towards mental health care without labels and of relevance to users. Tim Van Os, uh, Professor of Psychiatric Epidemiology and Public Health. Wow, that was difficult to <laughs> pronounce. At the Utrecht University Medical Center in Netherlands and visiting professor of psychiatric epidemiology at King's College Institute of Psychiatric Psychiatry in London, UK. In theory, I know how to pronounce it, but it just doesn't come out of my mouth. So please, Tim, um, the floor is yours. Thanks very much for the invitation. It's really uh, great to be here. And um, the topic I will address in, in about 15 minutes is the topic of mental health reform in the Netherlands. Um, and it all started uh, about uh, 30 years ago. Can I, can I get the first slides, perhaps? This one? Yeah? No, it doesn't move forward. So, no, doesn't work. Okay, well, it doesn't matter. You can do without slides. <laughs> so this, this, to give you the background, this started all 30 years ago when we examined. Eh? Does it work now? Yeah. 
So this started all 30 years ago. Never mind, it's okay. We can do without the slides. But it started 30 years ago when I was working in London. And I had worked in France and in Spain and in the Netherlands in mental health uh, institutions. And we decided to publish a paper on a comparison of the mental health systems in European countries. And we concluded that uh, uh, there was extreme heterogeneity in the different countries, not just in the way the mental health systems were organized, but also uh, in the concepts of mental health and mental ill health that clinicians had in these different countries and in treatments and in user involvement and in what type of reform uh, was required. In short, there was no agreement, uh, and we published that in the British Medical Journal. And now, 30 years later, is there any change? Um, and uh, what we think is that, in fact, um, we are still struggling in uh, Europe in finding the right way to organize mental health services. Um, so uh, the problem we have uh, in medicine is this. This is a very broad problem, but it's very relevant to psychiatry, is that thanks to modern technology, medical technology, our life expectancies are increasing all the time. However, at the same time, and this is the paradox, we see that healthy life expectancy is declining. So we live longer, but with less quality of life, thanks to modern medicine. Uh, and of course, we want to address this topic uh, and this paradox. And what we think is the matter is that, of course, treating illness by itself will not improve health of the population. For that, those conducting medicine need to be very aware that they are required to add value to individuals' lives rather than treating the organ for symptoms. Um, so this is the, the modern change in medicine, which is called the moral era of medicine, meaning that doctors are supposed now to talk to their patients to see if what they do is of any use to the health and lives of patients. So this sounds very simple, but this is the, actually the great revolution currently taking place in medicine, and particularly in psychiatry. Why? Because... You see there Sir Robin Murray, who conducted a mental health survey in the United Kingdom, only to find that they have a, a system that is very unfriendly to patients and doesn't deliver the standard of care that we're supposed to in the 21st century. It's not just Europe, same in the United States, where uh, the state of the mental health uh, services are abysmal. And we've seen similar surveys in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Spain, all concluding that something needs to be done. But what is that? Okay, so the criticisms that were voiced in these surveys are that mental health services in European countries are centered around an individual medicalized approach. And we know that the medical approach for mental health leads to fragmented care it leads to inequality in access to services. It leads to a power imbalance between users and doctors that is very difficult to redress in the current system. It leads to over-reliance on medications to address mental problems. And of course, it has no impact on population mental health. If you treat mental ill health, then you can never treat enough, you'll never improve the rate of mental ill health in young people. So these are severe problems, and um, what needs to be done? So then uh, I'd like to take you to uh, another country. Uh, can I have the next one, please? You can't. Uh, this isn't. So I'll take you virtually. You can't see it, but I'll take you to Iceland. Because in Iceland, they had a rather... Uh, illuminating thought. And that is that they saw, as they saw, it's okay, it's okay, they saw, as they saw in the Netherlands, that 
um, the rates of mental ill health in their young people were increasingly at a, uh, increasing at an alarming rate. Uh, and here you see the data from the Netherlands. We've seen, we conduct these huge mental health surveys every 15 years, very methodologically correct surveys. And what we've seen to our astonishment is that for the first time in the history of these surveys, the rates in young people have doubled, the rates of mental ill health have doubled over the last 15 years. And we also saw that this started before COVID. So it's not just COVID, it started before COVID. And this means two things. It means first, if you have such a change in 15 years, it must be something in the environment, not in the brains of young people, in the environment. Social causes are at play. And secondly, it means that if the rates of ill health in young people are up to 40% every year, that means that it will always completely exceed the capacity of any mental health system that you want to bring to bear in your country. It's impossible to address these rates in a medicalized mental health service. Impossible. So now uh, I take you to these comments because we get comments in the press that are highly critical of contemporary psychiatry. New York Times, the Boston Review, uh, summarizing research that indeed social and existential factors in the environment are responsible for the alarmingly high rates of mental ill health in young people. And for that to be redressed, we need to have a different system. And this is what they did in Iceland. Very interesting. They decided to replace the medical mental health system for young people with a public mental health approach meaning that they were not treating illness, rather they were looking at the environment of children. Are children playing with each other? Do children have safe places to go to? Do they eat with their parents? Are there parental conflicts in their houses? All sorts of the things in the environment. So they started to fix the social and the existential environment of children. And very interestingly, the rates of mental ill health have come down rather dramatically over the last uh, few years in Iceland. And this is not an isolated finding. Always we see that somebody, if, some, if, if one changes the medicalized system for a public health approach, it leads to reduction of mental ill health because it's much more effective. So this is about health promotion, health literacy, about non-medical early intervention in vulnerable groups. It's about building resilience in the population uh, and all sorts of other things that are summarized under the, the, the name uh, salutogenesis. Um, so what we did in the Netherlands then is we said, well, if, this, if the individual medical approach is not very effective, it needs to be combined with a collective public mental health approach because that approach is collaborative, it's inclusive, it has a focus on the social and the cultural and the existential environment, it has a range of integrative approaches building on resilience, and it has a much more a larger effect on population uh, level of burden due to mental ill health. So how we know this, but how do you do it? I think this is the big question. How do you change from a medical system with huge vested interests? These interests are huge, not just commercial, also in terms of psychological specialists and psychiatric specialists who claim uh, to know how to redress these problems. So what we did is we, we said, well, if this is true, we need a different concept of mental distress. We need a different approach towards treatment. And we need a different kind of organization. <laughs> so this is the situation in the Netherlands, typically. So you have social care, you have integrative medicine, you have the GP care, addiction care, informal care. You have uh, user-run recovery colleges and you have public health. But the mental health system is isolated 
and not integrated in these different care domains. And the most difficult part we have to do in our social trials is this. We have to convince these partners to work together collaboratively in a public mental health ecosystem uh, based on values of co-creation with users. This is the work that is most difficult because there are so many vested interests in the bureaucracies of social care and medical care in European countries that in practice it is very, very difficult to get them to collaborate together. You can spend 80 million or more, they won't collaborate unless you can convince them to do this based on values of we have to look after young people with mental ill health. Don't do your own thing, work together. Go, go work together in an ecosystem. So this is the first step we took in, in several regions in the Netherlands. And some were persuaded. And then we introduced qualitative differences in the way they work. Namely, uh, we give care seekers much more options to freely find how they want to work on their mental ill health. We, it's not prescriptive in the medical sense. We let people choose. We also uh, uh, have a contextual view of mental distress, not a medical view of mental distress. So we always contextualize young people's complaints. We uh, have a huge, we create a huge increase in care capacity by working in groups, which is commercially less interesting, but you know, uh, much more viable. Um, we ask the specialists in the mental health care system to work differently. We ask them to work flexibly and work in the ecosystem where they are required. And they can, we ask them to improvise there and not be locked up in their rooms doing specialist treatments. Um, and we have increased capacity of user-run recovery colleges. This, these are a very important resource in mental health. They're very successful and very popular with users. Um, and we also have the online version of recovery colleges. So fairly simple system that is now uh, run in five system in five regions and what we simply do in these regions is we ask the different institutions to create to co-create an ecosystem um, and then um, to do that in a bottom-up fashion with the stakeholders in the region including insurers and then we have of course we evaluate through quantitative and qualitative research. Um, so thanks very much for allowing me to present this. Uh, the bottom line is mental health. We know how to conduct mental health reform. The theory is there. We know uh, what is wrong with the current system. But in the different European countries, I think it's going to be, uh, in each country, it's going to be difficult in a different fashion to get all these stakeholders together to create similar public mental health uh, approaches towards building resilience uh, and uh, use an, a collaborative approach. Um, so thank you very much and this was my contribution. Thank you, uh, Yimas Os, uh, for an excellent introduction to the topic. And uh, then again, the same. Uh, do we have any acute questions at this phase? Yes, please. C can you please introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Department. Yes, please. Uh, uh, my name is Irene. I'm a physician from the Netherlands, and I practice um, uh, uh, integrative healthcare. My, my question is, uh, Dr. Van Oss, um, uh, what do you think about the experience of blue zones? Uh, we know about blue zones, and fortunately we have blue zones in Europe, like Sardinia in Italy, we have Icaria in Greece, and blue zones are known with a lot of centenarians and a lot of healthy people. But what's, what's your opinion about that? Thank you. Yes, so, so I, I, would, I would thank you very much for your question. I, I would reply that from a, a public health perspective, we know, for example, that if you compare Italy and the Netherlands, then 
the loan they started in back in 1980 with the, so, the same longevity, uh, but since then they have been deviating. The longevity in Italy is increasing much more rapidly than in the Netherlands. Uh, but not just that, they also have less suicide rates, they have less chronic depression, their youth is doing better in terms of mental health. And the interesting thing is, it's not because of healthcare, because we spend much more on healthcare than Italy does. So it's in the environment, it's the social capital or gene uh, food interactions or other lifestyle factors that are at play. So I think this is typically why public health is so important. The blue zones are uh, life examples of public health, I think. Thank you. And then we'll move on uh, to our next uh, uh, speaker. Um, and uh, that is uh, Roger Hoenders, Integrative uh, Psychiatry, Senior Research and Director of the Lenti Center for Integrative Psychiatry, Groningen, the Netherlands. And then uh, after that, I'll turn uh, the chairperson responsibility to my good colleague, please. At what time? Yeah. I do have a bit of an issue, but then Tony will need to lead because we both need to leave a bit of uh, ahead of the time uh, when the event is ending. But we'll sort it out. And anyway, now we turn the floor to Rogier, please. Thank you very much for your introduction and for inviting me here today. I'm very happy to be here. I'm a psychiatrist of the Center for Integrative Psychiatry of Lentus, a, a large mental health care institution in the north of the Netherlands. I've been working in psychiatry for 25 years, and I see every day many dedicated professionals doing the best they can for their patients. But we are working in a broken system, and we are too dependent on medication and one-to-one -one talking therapies, so we need to expand this, and this is my major point for today. Can I have the first slide? Yes, thank you. So I, could, I, I would argue we are in crisis with mental health care. It's been said already by the previous speakers. We have one third of the burden of disease in the world is due to mental disorders. We have some effect with treatments, but only about 50 to 60 percent. And if we do, we reduce symptoms, but we don't have full recovery of social roles and a societal uh, position. Then we have the influence of the pharmaceutical industry, we have the side effects of medication, we have waiting lists, we have high costs, we have the stigma of mental health care, we have a shortage of professionals, which, and the, those who are there, they are mostly overstressed and burnout. out. <laughs> And then, as uh, um, Professor Van Os already said, we have a capacity that's very small. We can help in the Netherlands 7% of the population with the present system, but we know that 24% of the population wants or needs help. So it will never work. We have to change the system. This was already true before COVID, and now it's even more. This has already been addressed. So we have a, a crisis, but as you can see, the sign the Chinese sign of crisis is made up of two different signs. The first one is danger. And on the left and on the right sign, uh, also crisis means change or opportunity. So let's see what this opportunity uh, can arise from the present crisis. So um, here are five professors of psychiatry. The one on the right has already been spoken, uh, speaking before me today. But others are giving a similar uh, direction. They are pointing to us look in this direction. So, for instance, David Shevon Schreiber was a professor of psychiatry in Pittsburgh, very well known, and was also a mentor and a friend of mine. And when he had a tumor in his brain and he was treated by his oncologist, he asked his oncologist, what can I do to help you help me? So, in other words, what can I contribute to my recovery? And he didn't get an answer, so he went on, an, on a search and an adventure, and he's been writing many books about it. For instance, Anti-Cancer, you can find on the internet. 
And uh, Jim Gordon is professor of psychiatry in, in Washington, leading the mind-body medicine uh, department there. And he has emphasized we have to move from health care to self-care and to mutual care. That means not always be dependent on the system, being able to do something yourself, similar to what David Seville Schreiber was saying. And Bessel van der Kolk is a Dutch psychiatrist uh, who has been doing a lot of research on trauma. And he says we have to look also below the neck because there is something there below the neck. We always look at the brain and the head, but there is also a body. And we have to include the body in when we look at trauma and treatment. And, again, and then Fikan Patel has always pointed out that there are places where there is no doctor or no psychiatrist. So what do we do? And all of them, they point to the, the same story. They say we have to focus more on self-care, empower patients what they can do themselves if the system is not there or if there is no help they can get. So if we focus on these kind of ideas, it's usually about lifestyle, it's about spirituality, then we increase our ability to cope with the situ we ha situation we have. And that means we increase our ability to deal with difficulties, our resilience to disease. Um, we can understand this when we have a different uh, definition of health. The old one you can see on the screen is from the WHO from just after the Second World War. And it's a complete state of physi physiological, sociological and um, psycho psychological well-being and not merely the absence of disease. This is static and idealistic. And one of our colleagues from the Netherlands, Machtelt Huber and her team, have been uh, suggesting we need to look at health more in a dynamic way, being able to adapt to the challenges of life, be they physical or emotional or social. That means we have to focus from a static definition to a more dynamic one, building our resilience, and not looking only at taking away symptoms, pathogenesis, but also to increase health. Salatogenesis. And then health is no longer only the domain of healthcare professionals or the system, but it's a concern of all of us. And if that is the case, we can have more capacity to deal with all the difficulties that come to us. So people ask me sometimes, so can we really change our own health by lifestyle? I would say no. We cannot not influence our health. In other words, we, if you like it or not, you are influencing your own health all the time. And the main point is not if you are able, the point is if you are aware in which direction you are heading. And that is due to our uh, lifestyle. So how does that work? There are 17 mechanisms at least. I'm not going to show all of them, but to point two of them, epigenetics shows us that our genes are also not fixed. Our genes are adaptive and they can be activated or deactivated because of lifestyles. And so you can see around the cell on the screen that running, emotional health, the environment, they all influence the activity of our DNA and the way it's being used to go into the cells. So this is a way that lifestyle changes help to get a better result on our health. And another way is in our brain. Also the brain is not static. The brain is highly adaptive. As we are speaking now, our brains are changing. I hope for the better. <laughs> we try to do that. We are making connections, as you can see on the right side. We are making new connections all the time, and we are also breaking the old ones. So in this way, our brain adapts to the environment, and this we can use when we change our health by lifestyle. So this explains it. And when we look at the mental part, the best way for us is to have meaning in our life, to have a sense of spirituality or religion or atheism, whatever is important to you. But if you have a sense of meaning together with an ability to cope with your life, manageable and understandable, then the three come together and this gives us a sense of coherence with ourselves and our lives. And that increases health. So this is the basis of salatogenesis, as Antonovsky has shown us. There's also a physical side to it. Of course, we also need to have the right nutrition, exercise, stress reduction, sleep enough, not too much use of alcohol and drugs and junk food, healthy relations. And I put two ones together, they are extra. 
The one is uh, on the right, the pink one is spirituality, and the other one is screens, sitting still and using social media. And I think all of these eight factors are important in our health, and they can be adjusted for increasing our health. And maybe this is the most important one for you to remember. On average, you will remember one or two slides. So my, my question to you is, remember this one, uh, because it's very important. This is from the WHO. And this is the percentage of um, interventions which create health. So to what extent is our health being created by medical care? You can see there 11%. Only 11% of our health is being predicted by using the medical system. On the right, you can see 36% is being determined by our behavior and about 24 social circumstances, as Jim has been explaining. So what we are doing now, we are putting our emphasis, our money, our attention, our energy into the small 11%, which is not efficient. We need to change and to put all our energy and attention to the right side of the circle, which is far more effective. Quick question before you proceed. If you go to the slide before, you, was I, did I hear it right? You said that social media is also helping us? Yes, social media and any other thing can be used for increasing health or for increasing sickness, depending on how you use it. So we know that many people are using this kind of uh, phones or Fitbits or other uh, uh, electronic devices, and they see at night, oh, I didn't walk so much, I didn't sleep so much, so I have to change my behavior. If we use them this way, similar with social media, it's healthy. But the way in most youth and old people are now using social media, it increases the problem. So it's a good point. Uh, yeah, but it's, this is very important. Many things can be used in both ways. We need to be uh, skillful in the way of using it. So my point here is we have to, to divert our attention and not only spend on medical care, still do that, but put more attention to the social domain and the individual behavior. But an individual is never isolated. So we have to be careful not to put the blame on individuals. So you are sick, it's your own problem because you didn't run or you eat too much. This is not my point because we are social beings. We are highly influenced by our networks, our family, our friends, and this is also very important. Jim put uh, the emphasis on the model of Iceland when they were very effective in putting down drugs and alcohol in the youth. How did they succeed? By a systemic approach taking the individuals, but also the schools, their friends, everything together. And we have to remember that many people start with a disadvantage. They start in an area in the countries when there is together addiction, illiteracy, trauma, poverty, and then it's very difficult to change. So I, I want to emphasize this. I'm not pointing to people there that are stupid because they are sick. Uh, many people have different um, problems which make it difficult for them to change, but it's still possible. And this is my some like mixed message. We have to f look at individual behavior, but also in a systemic way. And it's not their own fault, but they can get out of it if they change their lifestyle. And we have to help them with it. And then, of course, th this already starts very young when we are in uh, school, our, our upbringing at home. This all determines a lot of our lifestyle. And um, also, many schools have now junk food around the schools. So this is a, an area where politicians can make the difference in helping us to make laws that prevents uh, these junk food chains to be around the area where young people are. Because they throw their healthy food they got from their parents outside and they start eating in the cafeteria. So we have to be careful there. And uh, this also asks for an investment in public health. So if you invest in healthy di diets, you get 10 times or 11 times of your money back. If you go to alcohol, eight times, tobacco, seven times, activity, three times. So it's highly effective if you invest in public health, but we don't do so much until now. And then we, if we would do that, we would make this transition that Jim already said in his words. We have to go from medical interventions to quality of life and recovery from curing diseases to in increase health, 
from paternalism and professionalism to empowering patients to take care of their own health by giving them examples and also abilities and going from reductionism to holism. This is a way we have to change the system to adapt the, the crisis we are in. This is a theory. Now in daily practice, because this may all be very fine and nice, but does it really work and how do you do it? We have been doing this with my team for 17 years. This has been very difficult. We had a lot of opposition at the start, criticism, people uh, attacking us because we did a different approach to psychiatry. Then for some years it was a little bit quiet. Now things have completely changed and we are almost celebrated for our approach. So it's very nice to be able still around here to be witness of that. Um, so I am the director of an outpatient clinic for patients with severe chronic therapy resistant mood, uh, trauma and anxiety disorders combined with disorders, addiction problems, unexplained physical symptoms, everything together. Difficult, complex and long lasting. Many of them are suicidal and they ask me for end-of-life support because of their, uh, their mental problems. They have an average of illness and treatments of 10 years become, before they come to us. So we are a last resort. And we put into practice the vision I just explained. We look at them and we try to first have a therapeutic relationship because you can have a brilliant intervention, but if the patient doesn't trust you, the therapy will not work. So first we have to maintain and establish a, a trust in a therapeutic relationship. Then we take away symptoms, but we also increase health and resilience. We look on a broad way, biological, sociological, psychological, but also ecological and spiritual. This is a holistic view, which helps patients to recover. I'm going to put you four small elements of our approach and then show you if it really works with our data. So the first start is conventional psychiatry. This is the best psychiatry has to offer, but I'm sorry to say we are losing it. I see in many places, not only in our own uh, institution, but around the country, that it's the, the treatments are being offered are getting smaller and smaller. It's a focus only on cognitive behavioral therapy and medication. And if you're lucky, one or two other things. But psychiatry, in its essence, for, for decennia, has so much more to offer. For instance, looking at bodily health, relapse prevention, uh, looking at social psychiatry, somatic screening, different psychological therapies, self-help, creative expression. This, from my perspective, should be the basis, the best of psychiatry, but it's not always there. This is our starting point. And on top of that, we put a lot of emphasis on lifestyle change. So it's about mindfulness, compassion, yoga, uh, nonviolent communication, stress reduction, and also combined lifestyle intervention with diet, exercise, sleep, and relaxation. And we have done randomized clinical trials showing their effectiveness. This is really work, but it's difficult for patients to change. And we can help them to change if we ourselves also change because we are also humans as professionals. And it's far more strong if you give an advice that you embody yourself. So if I say to a patient, you should do mindfulness meditation, I've read in a book that it's useful, then it's diff different than if I say, I'm doing this for 10 years myself and I know what I'm talking about. So I think it's important for um, professionals to, to do this for our own well-being because of the burnout, but also have a stronger case for our patients. And we have done this in our center. We have trained hundreds of our own employees in the basics of lifestyle change. And all of us, we are also working every day on ourselves. On top of that, we use a selection of about 10 to 15 natural medications. And this we do because many patients who come to our clinic have a negative side effects of conventional medication. They have problems with their sex life. They have become fat. They have difficulty with walking, sleeping, many different things. They have in their blood too high of sugar or fats. So these are all the side effects of the medications we are prescribing. And I also use conventional medicine when it's needed. But my uh, experience is that for some of the patients, we can sometimes complement or even change to nat natural medications. This is about herbs 
supplements, vitamins, minerals, probiotics, and psychedelics. And I'm going to cover all of them in my... No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm going to close, but I just wanted to say that there are many of them which are very effective. I'm going to show two of them. This is St. John's Wort. This is a meta-analysis of randomized clinical trials, the highest evidence we have, and it shows clearly that it's as effective as conventional medicines with 40% less side effects. There's no zero side effects. There can be side effects, and it can be also severe, so there should be a doctor involved, but you can work with them. And the same is true for lavender, which can be very effective against anxiety and sleeping on the same level of conventional medicines with no addiction and no so much side effects. So there, these are some examples of things we can use, and patients are so happy if we talk about this in a way that they give them advice how to use it. Because they go to the internet and they can read so many things, but they don't know how to, how to know, how to find their way. So we need to help them to make the decision. And finally, our fourth part is we have conventional plus, the best of psychiatry, lifestyle, natural medications, and then complementary medicine. We advise them how to use acupuncture, homeopathy, healing, whatever they want, in a safe way. And we have uh, described this in a protocol. You can read it on the Internet if you like, or send me a message on LinkedIn. I will show it to you. Uh, but we have done this in a way that gives maximum room for complementary medicine, but within the legislation and the guidelines of psychiatry. And finally, um, uh, before I go, the, the one more. This uh, picture is the, the winner of the Nobel Prize in medicine and physiology. And up to you, and she was a researcher on traditional Chinese medicine. Maybe you know, in 2015, she got the Nobel Prize. And this shows that there is a lot of potential in complementary medicines, and we need science to find our way how to use it in a safe way without getting problems. Our way of working has been spreading a little bit throughout the country. We have about 15 psychiatrists working in uh, institutions, in private practices, and they are reporting, uh, they are happy with, to do this. Then we have also a consortium for integrative medicine, not only psychiatry, but whole of medicine. I'm not going to speak about it today, but you can find it on the internet. So we're trying to, to use this approach, not only for psychiatry, but for the whole of medicine in Holland. And then, of course, does it really work? I've just analyzed with my team the last weeks uh, the data of the last 10 years. These are patient-reported outcome results. This means we ask them if they have been improved during our treatments. We have had about 1,750 uh, referrals in the last 10 years, and about uh, 1,300 of them got into treatment in our center. 80% filled out all the baseline data. 52% filled out also all the follow-up measurements. This is not 100%, but for this kind of research, it's quite uh, normal and quite high even. We looked if the responders to our questionnaires maybe were different than the non-responders, but we couldn't find that, so there was no uh, big differences. The only difference was that they had less severe illness, so the most severe cases are inside of our analysis. And what we see is a significant improvement on all the aspects of life that we have been looking at. So they have less pathology, more resilience, better quality of life, more well-being. And remember, these are patients with a uh, history of more than 10 years of treatment and disease before they got to our clinic. And they are also very happy with the approach, looking at the high satisfaction on the overall on the effects of treatment, how they were being treated. Um, they, we asked them, did you actually have a chance for shared decision making? Could you have an, your own ideas inside the treatment plan? And they said, yes, I could get that. Uh, we had a clear explanation. The family was involved. We were taken very seriously, and it was easy to get in contact. So it looks at this approach, the best of conventional medicine, Psychiatry combined with the best of lifestyle and natural medicines leads to a big change of health to the better and a lot of patient satisfaction. So just one cautious note, this is not a randomized clinical trial. So I cannot claim that this is high um, scientific proof, but the data 
patients are reporting are very positive. So to conclude, I've shown you that I think mental health care is in crisis. But crisis is not only a danger, it's also an opportunity. An opportunity for change, to look at health not from a static definition of WHO from 48, but a more dynamic one, including our ability to adapt to the changes in our social system, in our physical and our mental situation. In this way, we go from a more static to a more dynamic view, and we go from the present system, which is more like a sickness care model we now have. We only go to treat and to pay for treatments if patients get really sick, so we have a sickness model. We have to go from sickness to healthcare, from healthcare to self-care and mutual care, and then we can address all the problems. In this way, we have the best of two worlds, conventional psychiatry, with all the rest I explained, lifestyle, natural medicine, spirituality, and traditional medicine. Our data show the patient reported outcomes. Uh, pe pe people get less pathology, more resilience, more well-being, daily functioning goes up with high patient satisfaction. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you. That was a true believer really inspiring uh, intervention. And uh, now we follow the same line. Any quick questions? Could I? Yes, please. This is more than a comment. I wanted to make it before Manuela left. She's not here. Thanks, Roger, for pointing to certain things. I want to connect this with the 300, this year is the 345th anniversary of the publication of a book called Hortus Malabaricus Indicus. The original copies are at the University of Leiden. This is with respect to your slide on non the herb-based interventions. There is a long history. Uh, Jim, you talked about 30 years. And 30 years on, things haven't changed. I'm talking about 345 years. And things haven't changed. You go back in time, we have 5,000 years of history. Things might not change. Maybe the time is right to think about that historical context and make it relevant for us. Thank you. Do you want to? There is one question from the chat, and that is a question like this. How do you integrate the immune system in your strategy? Is there something for you, Roger? Yes? Um, I don't think we go on a, on a regular daily basis, including the immune system, but it's an important question because I think we know that the immune system is related to cytotogenesis and our resilience. And we know, for instance, that as we have been changing our diet in the Western countries, we take a lot more of omega-6 compared to omega-3. This gives a low-grade chronic inflammation of our bodies. And this has to do with the immune response, and it's being linked to a lot, a lot of mental illnesses. So yes, there are avenues to, to look more if we can increase health also in that way. John, could I just add to this the connection between the gut microbiome, the local inflammatory system, vagal tone, and then secondary effects of food choices. You know, When people are already in an unstable state, they tend to make certain preferences that aggravate that dysbiosis already. And this is touching on Jim's comments. There are other issues that we need to look at. You know. We cannot approach this as presented by both of you using just a pharmacological approach. We need a slightly wider perspective. It's been discussed for decades, but nothing is happening. Maybe the time is right again. Yes, I'd just like to comment on that and then we can move on. Um, Yes, we need the best of both worlds. Uh, this is why we call it this way. And yes, um, the, the, um, the microbiome is a very, uh, very important. It's another one of the mechanisms through which we, can we always change our health and we can increase our health. And the point of view making that people who are sick, they tend to make the choices which keep the sickness there. So if we are out of balance, we crave for those things which are not healthy for us. And if we are in balance, we crave for that which is balanced. So we have to maintain our balance and not get sick in the first place. The, in the context, Tom, 
permission in the context of COVID. I know there's a lot of COVID discussion going on. There is excellent result now about the nasal microbiome and the dysbiosis here, you know, and how it affects neuroinflammation. So if you look at where the pituitary sits, it is literally upstream from the nasal microbiome and how there are interventions today for giving you resilience. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you. Yes, the next speaker is Gustav Dobos, uh, Professor of Complementary Integrative Medicine, Head of our Department of Complementary Integrative Medicine at the University of Duisburg, Essen, Germany, Mind Body Medicine for Physical and Mental Health. Thank you. And next speaker, may I introduce you at the same time, because I understand it was a joint presentation. Anna Paul, head of a department uh, uh, of the mind and body medicine of the clinic of uh, neuropathy and integrative medicine section of integrative oncology, oncology and within the project of integrative psychosomatics at KEM uh, from Germany also. Please do all the floor is yours. So thank you very much. Madam Chair, um, doesn't, I am now. My name is Gustav Dobos, I'm from Germany, from Essen, and I'm Professor of Internal Medicine at the University of Essen and Chair for Complementary and Integrative Medicine at the University of Duisburg-Essen. And over the past 25 years, I was uh, founding director and director of a clinic of a hospital for complementary and integrative medicine was the first in Europe, uh, the hospital, and now we have f uh, five hospitals, similar hospitals, in Germany and in Switzerland. We treated approximately 40,000 patients, and uh, in our hospital as a model institution, everything was covered by the insurance companies. And. Uh, we are a research uh, institution and we did research at the same time while we were treating the patients and we published approximately 300 papers and 40 meta-analysis. I, I will only show one meta-analysis because otherwise it might be too boring for, for everybody. So what is integrative medicine according to our opinion? It's mainstream medicine. It's a scientifically proven uh, complementary medicine. And the third part is mind-body medicine, a very specific kind of, of, um, of a mindfulness-based uh, uh, lifestyle modification. So um, a lifestyle modification in terms of a resilience training. And that's very important, the resilience part of, of, uh, of our model. I will to give a similar talk as Roger before, but from a different perspective. We, are, we were treating like internal patients, with the patients with chronic internal diseases and with chronic pain. In general, these patients were suffering from their chronic disease in seven years, and they were at a state where nobody could help them anymore. So and this kind of patients came to our hospital and in this patients, the, the, the insurance companies covered everything. But of course, these patients were also depressed. And approximately 50 to 70 percent of all the patients had some kind of, of, of a mental problem. And the surprising part of our work at the beginning was that, of course, they got better physically, but they also got better psychologically, mentally. After one week, they were much better than before. And if, like a young doctor, uh, did a patient history with one patient, he came and told me he's very depressed. He went for a one-week holiday, came back, went in this room, came back to me and asked, what have you done to this guy? He's completely changed. And that was very interesting for us because he never expected this. And we started in my research department to look at the literature on 
on a number of, of complementary treatments whether they have any effect on the on the on the mental side, and we di we discovered 26 different different uh, methods that also uh, have a positive um, a positive meta analysis bet uh, concerning concerning mental health. In my talk, I would like to focus on mind body medicine for some reasons, and uh, it includes meditation, yoga, a structured non performance oriented exercise program. It's not the marathon run of a 50 years old guy uh, just before he's changing his wife. No, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, a non-performance oriented uh, exercise program. And, uh, and it includes a mental stabilizing Mediterranean diet as well as a social support program in terms of human relationships. Uh, if we were talking to our patients, explaining them what mind-body medicine is, it's not easy. So we ask patients to tell us after they uh, were through the program, what is mind-body medicine? And the best answer is this. Mind-body medicine <laughs> is a therapy for a thicker skin. And that's exactly what the definition of resilience means. Resilience is is the process and outcome of successfully adapting to difficult or challenging life situations, especially through mental, emotional, behavioral uh, flexibility and adjustment to external and to internal uh, demands. So why is mental health important for us as Europeans? And why is mind-body medicine important in mental health or for mental health? That's a very important point. So depression is the most frequent ailment of an aging society. This, the incidence, especially in the younger population, as mentioned before, of course, increased significantly during COVID-19, staying on a high level even after COVID. That's interesting. And the pool prevalence is 45%. Uh, another reason is up to 50% of patients seeing a GP, a general practitioner, are suffering from some kind of a som somatoform disorder, a mental health condition in which the person feels significantly depressed about physical symptoms. That's, by the way, also meta-analysis we published in the Deutsches Ärzteblatt. On this slide, we can see young people, of course, and also the very uh, depressing, actually, fact that the number of young people being at a risk of suffering from a depression for, uh, increased fourfold during the, the, the COVID-19 uh, time and, and stays, at, uh, stays at this level, and especially the young women, the 80 to 24-year-old uh, women were the, the group who was uh, who with the lowest level of mental well-being. So now I, I'm focused on why mind-body medicine is important for mental health. Uh, Officially, antidepressive drugs actually work only in 50% of the patients, but with a high number of so-called selective publications. That means that negative results in studies are not being published. And the, the, this number is approximately 31%, and if you subtract the, the, the selective publications from the 50% number, you come to a number of 35 to 40% that's approximately the placebo level for the low bis and until medium kind of depression. The very severe kinds of depression, of course, they, they, uh, the, in, in this case, depress uh, antidepressants are useful and, and, ho and hopefully works as well. That's the, first, that's the first reason. Antidepressants don't work so well. And the other, the, the other reason is for psycho, 
therapy, at least in Germany, long waiting lists exist of, of, uh, up to six months. I don't know how it's in other countries, but I guess it might be very uh, similar. So, and beside that, mind-body medicine is a very effective way to treat depression or to, to reduce the probability that a depression occurs. So that's the wellness, uh, illness, wellness continuum, continuum of the cellulogenesis. I only will only briefly talk about. Uh, Roger already mentioned the cellulogenesis. It depends on the re on the ability for resilience. If if a person is re resilient, he moves to the wellness rather to the wellness part of the continuum instead of the of the of the uh, illness part the left-hand side. And uh, illness and wellness are no opposites, but poles of a continuum leaning to the one side or the other direction, depending on the ability uh, to work with, it, with your life situation. And that's, that's the quotation of, uh, of Antonovsky, the famous quotation of Antonovsky, happiness of, hum of human beings is not dependent by the environment is not only dependent on the environment, but rather the ability to deal with the challenges. So, now let's talk about mind-body medicine. Uh, the term mind-body medicine was coined by Herbert Benson 40 years ago. Uh, Herbert Benson is a, was a, a Harvard-trained cardiologist, and at that time, it was not clever as a cardiologist to mention that a heart attack might have anything, that, that stress might have anything to do with a heart attack. Because I've, I've heard from, uh, from older colleagues, in this case, very often you would, would have been fired immediately because it was another paradigm at that time. But uh, meanwhile, the, ch the time has changed. And uh, as you can see here, the last, pa last uh, big paper on mind-body medicine was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the, the new era of mind-body medicine. And what are the, f the pillars? I mean, there are much more pillars, but these are the major pillars of mind-body medicine. That mind that's mindfulness. That's the basis. Mind Mindfulness-based kind of a lifestyle modification. Next, next is exercise, nutrition, social, social support. And on the left-hand side, you see the, the, the quotations, the Medline quotations, if you, if you enter the different terms like mindfulness and depression, exercise and depression, nutrition, psychiatry, social support, and mental health. There are thousands and thousands of different, of different papers, mostly with positive effects for exercise and depression and and social support and depression, I'm, I gave in the, the, the number of meta-analysis, like 800 and 1600. So a meta-analysis, the summary of like 50 to 100 different uh, scientific papers with a high quality showing the specific results. So there was a question on Luzon. That was, was a very interesting question because there are five different areas, areas in uh, worldwide with the, with the blue so, which count to the blue zone. And I think that these five areas uh, fulfill the, the, the requirements for mind-body medicine without knowing them, of, of course. They are somehow, somehow mindful, not in a meditative way, but you can be mindful in your daily living. The exercise on a regular, <clears throat> regular basis, mostly they work. They have a special kind of a nutrition, and nutrition is very, very important. I will talk about this a little bit later. And, of course, they have a very strong social ties, like the Italians. So, very good questions before. So, what is, what is uh, mindfulness? That's a term in German, it's Achtsamkeit, it's used very often, but most of the people don't even know what it is. Mindfulness, there is an, a good explanation of John Kabat-Zinn, uh, a professor who coined uh, the uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction. 
Uh, mindfulness is a non-judging awareness. And here on this cartoon, you see uh, a human being on the left side and on the right side, uh, a dog. And the dog is actually the role model for mindful <laughs> for for a mindful uh, living uh, living animal, he just focuses on the trees where he wants to pee, maybe, and the sun. And we have a a, a monkey herd running in our head all the time, and it's very difficult to stop this monkey herd. <laughs> I don't know whether you know what I mean. But if you meditate on a regular basis, sometimes you, you succeed to be like a dog for a few moments. <laughs> so, and the aim of mind body medicine is to strengthen resilience, as I told before, patient competence and self efficacy. So, let me briefly talk about uh, the one meter analysis. I was mention, mentioning before that's uh, one one work of my research director Heider Mahihala, who found 26 different complementary treatments with a positive meta-analysis, of course with different qualities, but there there are, for example, acupuncture, massage therapy, aromatherapy, dance, music phytotherapy, that's herbal treatment, a, a huge number of different treatments which you sometimes can very easily integrate in your daily living. And it has a positive effect on anxiety and depression. So my, my, face, my most favorite topic in mind-body medicine is nutrition. I'm at, I'm, from my training, I'm, I'm much in nutrition. I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I love to cook, and now at the University of Duisburg-Essen, I'm uh, building up a department for, for planetary health diet. So we integrate in, uh, a tasty, healthy, and clear, climate-friendly kind of a, of a nutritional, so-called planetary health diet for our patients in the hospital, 50,000 a year, and for, for the employees. And we have a teaching kitchen and do, do a lot of social, of, uh, social media work uh, with, with cooking. So, and what I'm really fascinated is the, the effect of nutrition on, on the mental health. The first study here, depression, uh, is, uh, is it treatment in adults utilizing dietary intervention? This, this study uh, showed that Mediterranean whole grain diet is an, an low in processed food has a significant antidepressant effect. And that's probably the kind of nutrition the Italians had, <laughs> or the Japanese or the Greek from Crete. And there is, a, there is another very interesting uh, meta-analysis showing that the Mediterranean plant-based diet rich in vitamins and fibers, nuts and olives, omega-3 fatty acids, for example, from flaxseed, because we cannot recommend fish, the fatty sea fish anymore because of the polluted uh, sea, low in trans fatty acids and uh, low in high, highly processed food leads to 67 reduced risk of depression. At the Harvard Medical School, Uma Naidu just recently opened a department for nutritional psychiatry. That's very exciting because also in nutrition you can easily integrate it into your daily li life. And it's not more expensive than the Western diet, but the Western diet is not healthy. There are huge studies showing that people who eat a Western diet have a very high risk of depression. And if they change to a Mediterranean diet, the depression uh, goes away. So now I come to my last point. It's uh, a study, the oldest, the longest study, uh, longest long longitudinal study uh, of, uh, it's the Harvard study on adult development, uh, started from the Harvard Grant study from 1930. 38, uh, including approximately 1,000 people. Uh, 
Robert Waldinger and Mark Schulz, I think, are the fourth or the fifth uh, study directors uh, over the last uh, 80 years. And the question was, what makes, what really makes a good and happy life? And the, re the result was, the stronger our relationships and more like, the, the more likely we are to live happy, satisfying, and overall uh, and overall healthier uh, lives. And uh, I would like to finish my talk with a quotation what, from, from uh, Robert Walding. What really counted in life was a loving relationship and the ability to find new friends when confronted with the loss of friends. Thank you very much. Yeah, maybe it works. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Anna Paul. I have been working with Professor Dobos in, in the field of mind-body medicine the last 25 years. And now I'll introduce the practical implications of what Professor Dobos had shown us. We have developed mind-body medicine interventions and programs okay, in different settings. First of all, we worked with the patients uh, with internal diseases, pain syndrome, cancer diseases, and psychosomatic diseases in the clinic of complementary and integrative medicine. The aim of this um, work is to empower the patient that they can do it by themselves, as you explain. In our clinic programs, they learn to use their resources for the safe regulation and mental health in daily life. And this is for 90% a group approach, group-based. Always we are in a group. Last week in the mind-body therapy group, the so-called Ordnungstherapy in German, a patient named Peter who suffers from chronic pain, anxiety, disorder, and depression reported his experience in the group. Peter, Peter he was invited to use hydrotherapy, you know, a wet, cold towel this wrap around the naked body, upper body. Cold. And he told us, the cold chest wrap made me feel a release of tension, a relaxation response. As I came to learn, this new and first rather negative bodily reaction then also influenced my mind. Because I learned that negative physical states also pass when I don't react. This insight has changed my attitude towards my anxiety triggers. They also pass when I don't react. Very early in our, uh, in our working, uh, we saw external colleagues, they working in other therapeutic settings, become very interested in our mind-body medical program and interventions. And so we started teaching programs for physicians and therapists, focusing on using mind-body approaches they could integrate, they could integrate in their work with their respective patients. And it became clear after the years there was a need for more preventive and educational approach. Financed by the German Ministry for Education and Research, we have over the years created programs that strengthen people resources for physical and mental health. We started in corporate settings, then moved to teachers' training and education, including universities, schools, and kindergartens. What do we, what do we mean if we talk about mind-body medicine in our clinical setting? This is a very fine def definition by the NIH formulated in 2006. It's very helpful because it invites us to acknowledge the systemic and interconnected self-regulation aspects of human being and to take good care, good care of them. The definition continues. Okay. This part of the definition implies that in our therapeutic and preventive programs, the patients and clients are not passive, 
but empowered and developed and used their own health resources to build up resil resil resilience. This understanding leads us to the concept of salutogenesis and sense of coherence. We heard from Roger and from Gustav. These three factors, uh, comprehensibility, manageability, and meaningfulness, define the mind therapeutic aspects of the interventions and programs we have designed. First, patients and clients need to know and to understand. For example, let's take stress and its effects on mental health. We teach people to identify and name stressors in their life. Then they understand how stress affects their health. They then experience in a safe group with like-minded people how their stress level goes down when they focus on their body and their breathing. In this process, they experience control and agency. This gives them a sense of satisfaction, meaning, and motivates them to continue in their everyday life. This is one example for stress reduction and mindfulness. The same applies to all these other health behaviors like exercise, nutrition, or social support. Mind body interventions use a variety of techniques we heard from Roger. Um, they are designed to facilitate the mind's capacity to affect bodily functions and symptoms, and vice versa. They also use techniques to facilitate the body's capacity to affect mental health, as we had, have seen from Peter's example and heard from Gustav. This is practically implemented therapeutically in the MECOM program, which, as already mentioned at the beginning, we have been carried out for the last 25 years in patient care and prevention. This approach needs a transdisciplinary team. Maybe you can see this is, uh, they have generalistic competences embodied and applied in complementary and integrative medicine settings. This is my wonderful MBM team, but not all, of course, some of them were in vacations or ill. <laughs> <laughs> the last time we did this, uh, this picture last week. These, um, these all are mind-body therapists. They are trained in the MECOM program in addition to their basic profession. Further, we see and we have also evidence that this systematic and holistic mind-body approach works. Mind-body medicine programs and interventions are recommended in German medical and prevention guidelines and research. Now, this leads to the conclusion. First, the holistic approach, which we have to implement in several hospitals in Germany, could be scaled to other countries. Second, we can offer to contribute posters that suggest mind-body trainings for increasing mental health in Europe for three target groups. The second is new tools. We have trained more than 3,000 health professionals in this MECOM mind-body program. The third is uh, Help the Helpers and Integrated Care. This is a new innovative project by Professor Dobosch with two topics, mind-body medicine and planetary health diet and nurses support. And at least the early start, the best practice. This is a training format for educators and teachers since 2018 by my colleague, Professor Nils Altner. Starting resilience from the very beginning with small, small children. Thank you for your attention. And now we can take a deep breath <laughs> if you want. Thank you very much, Anna Paul, for your the wonderful presentation to get together with Gustav Dobos. And uh, now I'll turn to my good colleague, uh, Maria Walsh, for your intervention, please. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, thank you very much, and thank you, Sirpa, for having me. And uh, good after, or good evening, crikey, uh, good evening to you all. I want to apologise uh, to every other speaker that I missed. Um, I heard you were very good uh, to the whole collective. Um, Oshin here from from uh, wearing a very Irish looking green jumper uh, was filling me in. Uh, I um, I give you a little bit of background on who I am and where I'm coming from. Um, Maria is my name. I'm uh, an Irish MEP, uh, one of our, our youngest. Uh, and I say that because that helps my mental health uh, <laughs> when, we're, when we're in a space uh, when mental health is often not discussed at the, the level I'd, I'd much appreciate it here in the parliament. Um, I'm a first time politician, so this is my first mandate. And I was really um, uh, in my first few days of school, as I like to call it, um, quite disheartened when uh, I came in and very much a part of my campaign was raising awareness. Uh, uh, one of the, uh, the drivers of me getting involved in the political landscape at Ireland and here at Europe was to, um, to begin to change the conversation around mental health uh, and the challenges that individuals face. Um, and from an Irish context, just the delay of which, uh, and I think it was on Gustav's slide, uh, six months is a standard uh, delay period. Unfortunately, in Ireland, we're seeing uh, youth services up to 13, 14, 15 months waiting. And you are all much more expert led in the field of mental health than I. And I can tell you this, if I was left at 35 years of age for that long um, without mental health, any sort of talk therapy supports, uh, I think we'd be in a, uh, I, I certainly would be in a much uh, different situation, never mind a younger person who's trying to understand transition periods, difficulties, challenges, um, and then if medication is required, how that works. So uh, long story short, I arrived here first day of school and I was very quickly told it's not seen as a competency of the EU. <laughs> Wasn't great on my mental health that day. However, my team and I uh, have really tried to, along with multiple other mental health uh, advocates here in the parliament, Sirpa being one, um, uh, to try and bring in conversations around our two uh, mental health uh, alliance groups, one a coalition, one alliance. Why we have two is still a little bit up in the air, but we're trying to form them together so that we could have a stronger base. Um, but it does come across right across the political landscape, which is quite promising because when we look at mental health, it can't just be one member state uh, or two or three, or the larger member states doing very well at national and sometimes European level, it has to be east, west, north, south. Otherwise, um, I often give the reference in Ireland that we have students um, or, or, or people who are enjoying the single market and the freedom of movement or studying overseas across 27 member states. Uh, and if they need support when they need it the most, if they can't get that across any of the 27 member states, then we're actually failing here in this institution. So I, I, I really, I really believe that and, and uh, I like that. From our side um, here in the Parliament, what is what Sirpa flagged? And if I'm going off on a tangent, Sirpa, please redirect me. Um, but here in the Parliament side, there's a couple of things we've been doing in the last few years. Um, very slow, unfortunately. So I'd love to hear any thoughts or insights understanding you've been in the room here since well over uh, a, a while now uh we should probably having this out in the park where we're walking out in some fresh air and waking up but if anybody has any thoughts either now or after please please let me know but a couple of things one being um an eu mental health strategy um trying to have best practices um and a uh, some in some rooms, uh, Sirpas and I in particular uh, groups don't always like the word directive, um, but can swallow framework. So trying to figure out leaning into your expertise, academic research, uh, leaning on larger bodies of research from the WHO or further afield, what we need to do to make sure member states are actually putting in practice uh, um, support systems at an EU level for, for their citizens. Um, uh, that's one, but it's quite a skyball idea uh, as I have it. So what we're working now is trying to bring um, ministers or representatives at a national level dedicated to mental health. So in my own country of Ireland, uh, we have a junior minister dedicated to mental health, trying to get them into the parliament in order, all 27 
uh, to try and figure out a better way that we can have a coordinated approach. From what I've been told, that has never been done before, but we're Irish, so we like a good fight. Uh, and uh, and the Parliament is certainly, as we're coming into elections, I think it, we, we certainly have an appetite for it. Plus, what we've learned from COVID, because I don't think any policymaker in particular came out of COVID not understanding mental health pressures. Um, so I think for many policymakers, they got a first-hand approach and a taste for what many citizens have been going through for, for many, many years. Um, so that's probably one of the only positives, I think, coming out of, coming out of COVID. Uh, we, we woke up to it as policymakers. Um, the second is an EU year dedicated to mental health. And what that looks like is essentially what it says on the tin, um, uh, a PR opportunity for us to break down a little of the stigma, the discrimination, um, around mental health, bring in elements of what I've just heard in terms of Anna and Gustav and no doubt many of the other speakers to try and bridge and break the barriers of if your nutrition is not in place, if your sleep is not in place, uh, if you do not have a social policy in terms of care community supports, what you know, what else can we be doing or how can we make sure um, all generations, not just young, are looking at mental health fitness or their own approaches to mental health um, and where to go when they need it the most. Um, uh, we did a piece of legislation, uh, an opinion piece, uh, under the Employment and Social Affairs Committee that looked at mental health in the digital world of work, uh, looking at how digitization post-COVID, has it been good or bad or indifferent? Um, uh, I personally got into politics to be around people um, and then you starved of people. So being online was quite difficult, um, but it allowed us to get through a lot of different pieces of legislation. Uh, and some of my friends and family really enjoy remote working. I personally, um, uh, as I mentioned, prefer people. So it's finding that hybrid model for, for all our workforce as well as uh, our student body to, to fit into that uh, and, and make work. Um, so within that body of opinion from the Employment Committee, many things got called like the psychosocial directive, which our S&D colleague called for, um, that EU mental health strategy, as I mentioned, the EU year dedicated to mental health. And then from that, um, uh, we heard in the State of the Union uh, in September last uh, from President Ursuline, uh, Ab Abandeline, God, I'm making her name, Ursula, we'll just call her good friend Ursula, um, that we will have a citizen's dialogue on mental health. I don't know if anybody in this room has had any insider gossip about what that will look like. If you have, please speak now. Um, I'm, I'm waiting to hear about it. But what I have heard is um, there will be a, multiple roundtables and then a body of research done by the WHO um, and the Red Cross, which I haven't figured out how that relationship will work. But once I do, I'll, I'll make sure and, uh, and, and liaise with you all. Um, ultimately, we have the best in class here sitting around this room uh, and around the EU. And we're certainly not putting people together to figure out uh, why uh, a statistic like the second leading cause of death for young people right now in Europe is death by suicide. Like that's a terrifying statistic. Um, and often when I start with and end in when I talk to anybody who will listen to me about mental health, because when we talk about the, the best in class economics here, single market, uh, the EU peace project, multiple wars that are going around in the world, never mind just in Europe. Um, and we're not talking about that number. We're in a drastic state of, of a future, uh, future, um, uh, building and an opportunity because that's our young Europeans. Um, uh, and with that, I really like to throw in some Irish jokes and then bring the mood way down with that statistic. So apologies. Um, but I think I covered everything from what was going on um, at an EU level here in, within the two intergroups that we have, but essentially love to open up the floor to you all in case if there's things that um, I missed. And if the, while Oshin wrote notes for me, uh, there's a solid chance he didn't write them very well. Uh, 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 so if the slides could be made available, I'd love to have them uh, just to make up um, for that. And uh, I just want to apologize for being late. I was at a mental health talk with a group of pharmaceutical students. Um, really interesting how their approach to looking at their industry within mental health for themselves and their patients. Um, and then how we combine green and digitization um, to make their industry work. And actually one statistic uh, that I'm going to be stealing forever more now is um, uh, the equivalent of an MRI uh, is about 160 kilometers in a diesel car. 
um, which I never knew. Um, and then when you take in mental health and to your point, uh, Gustav, in terms of diet and nutrition, um, while I would argue the Mediterranean countries have sun too, and as an Irish person, I, I, I don't know if, if, if the sun vitamin, uh, if the sun vitamin was, was a healthy way to deal with, uh, um, depression in those countries, but I should probably just follow the diet first before I start picking holes at your research um, and, and get an umbrella for Ireland. But uh, it just goes to show you there's so many great conversations going on and so much interest in trying to fix this. Uh, we just need to make sure we're putting these uh, all your minds together. Um, thank you very much and sorry if uh, my uh, my dialect wasn't very clean. Uh, uh, I've been in Ireland for the weekend, so <laughs> it gets a little bit muddy. So worse. yeah, yeah, it gets worse. Uh, well, I wasn't going to say worse, but okay. <laughs> yeah, it gets more Irish, more patriotic. Uh, but I, I just want to acknowledge Sirpa. Thanks very much, and, and to all the team, because uh, no doubt, uh, like like Sirpa, it's our teams that actually put a lot of the uh, the work together. So I just want to acknowledge uh, your team too, Sirpa, and uh, open for any questions and thoughts and comments. Bar you, since you, uh, <laughs> since you made fun of me, I said, okay. <laughs>
I mean, essentially, I, I, uh, I contributed in my brusty tones uh, as much as I could, no, I kid. Um, but really, uh, really, from like uh, Rogers, am I pronouncing that correctly, Rogers? But is there any other points or comments that you'd like to feed in? I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to the Commission. So, perhaps, uh, uh, if I may, perhaps one uh, issue that, that we could discuss or would be interesting for the two interest groups to actually debate is that uh, very often we see that the idea, the analysis of what goes wrong in the mental health system and what needs to be done is quite clear. And also there's many avenues towards solutions that are being proposed uh, in many countries, but um, the way to actually induce change is not very clear and is extremely difficult in uh, European uh, countries. For example, uh, what, what, what was 30 years ago a big problem for mental health and still is, is that there's two bureaucracies for social care and medical care in virtually all European countries. And clearly, if you have a mental health problem, you need an integrated approach of these two bureaucracies to, to help you with your problems. But nothing so difficult to actually change that. And I remember there was, a, I think 15 years ago, there was a, uh, an experiment in, in, in Manchester where the local authorities actually very courageously decided, well, you know, we put mental health care and social care, and we combine it into a, a huge... Uh, system And, of course, it failed completely because to go from A to B in such a complex change in our complex societies is immense. So the, the experts of change, I think, we need experts of change that can help us uh, go from A to B. For example, our, our, how, how do you go from a medical concept of mental ill health towards an integrative, contextual concept of mental health and mental ill health? How do you go from uh, uh, an, an, an individual medical system of mental health care that is funded in all European countries with vested interest and vested scientific uh, ideas towards something more collaborative and integrative. So these, these experts of change, I think, are going to be very important people, uh, that, that, and we need our help. Uh, otherwise, I'm, I'm, I find it in the Netherlands very, very difficult, you know, to even on a regional level to change something. And in Iceland, they were successful, I think, because A, it was just uh, youth mental health, that they went from a medical to a public mental health model. And also, there's only 300,000 of them. So, you know, it <laughs> makes things more easier. And systemic. systemic. And systemic, systemic yes. Yeah. Yes, they true. On a yeah. Level. yeah. And sorry to uh, disrupt you once again, but while now I need to leave, uh, one word, and uh, this is from the bottom of my heart, Don. Yeah. It has been wonderful to work with you. Yeah, that's great. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely, over the years. Over the years. Many years. <laughs> Many years. I remember uh, I was my first year to be MEP in Finland. I'm uh, in, in the European Parliament. I met Tony in Finland. There was a camp a meeting. I can't recall anymore what was for your meeting all about. And I was there suggesting that we should have a camp group in the European Parliament. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we discussed quite a lot what, what the Europe is doing and what the Finland is not doing and what should be done. And since those days, you have been a wonderful, reliable partner, doing a lot of work in the uh, field of integrative medicine, complementary and alternative medicine. I can always have tried to, uh, I always have been able to uh, rely on your knowledge, your integrity and your warmth and good heart. And the latest is not the smallest. And so I've been enjoying every minute of this work. And I hope you all the best, what a human being can wish to another one. Thank you. Let's give him a big round of applause.
And I'm sorry, I can't have the glasses, but you'll have to have my glass of wine too. That I'm wa wanting to do. I will drink your glass as well. Yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Sipa. <laughs> She doesn't say nice things about a lot of people, so you're obviously in good, good uh, standing. I kid. Yeah. Um, well, you, you may, may have missed it yeah. over, over the last few years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you good. were not you there. You put in the hours. You put in the hours. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, I want to just make sure. Is there anybody else to to come in here, sir? Yeah. 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 Is there anybody? Maria, could I? Uh, of course. Uh, could I just a before. few words before Veroni comes? Yeah. And I want of to make this an opportunity to connect what we pressed at here. To what, uh, to what I hope Veronique has already taken notes of Veronique. And, and uh, you started off with some statistics, 312 responses to a consultation, or those kind of numbers, you see. When we look at these open consultations, we see a very low feedback from the community. So the European community says, here is an open cons consultation, and you get limited numbers. The numbers you gave us today, only 27 member states respond to your call for consultations. Why is that? You recited some numbers early on. We are at a time when we are looking at global health. Uh, Professor Dobos has correctly highlighted where health solutions that we are looking for, for Europe, might reside somewhere else in the world. Are we prepared to see how we can draw in solutions that reside elsewhere? The Eurocam is an affiliated non-state actor for the WHO, Europe, and we play our part in taking that message forward. We would like to see more proactive engagement from the Commission. Oh, you look confused, Veronica. <laughs> Not yet. I just want to, bef bef before I go on to this, I just want to say best practice across Europe is vast. Mm -hmm. Is all of it being yeah. taken into account? You can see today from Netherlands, from Germany, the quality of expertise already. They're doing it for decades how these are not reflected in uh, the thinking within the Commission. Thank you. Great. Uh, just before I hand it over to Veronica, uh, anybody else want to come in? Are we good? Perfect. Uh, then I believe the final words are with you. To fix uh, all our problems. Uh, yeah. And have all the answers. That's what I, I can't do. That's what I no, say to Commissioner yeah. uh, Kyrgyz. No. All the time. To, to, first, responding to, to your last comment uh, question, uh, we are currently in a consultation process. And uh, we have uh, involved, of course, the member states, which are primarily responsible for the development of the health systems. Uh, stakeholders, NGOs, and citizens. Mm? So this is a very broad exercise using different tools and ways for the consultation process, including this call for evidence and the call for evidence at, for, as a purpose to uh, gain fact, facts and opinions also in order to support the elaboration of the Commission communication. And the process is still ongoing. Uh, and the process was so focused, in fact, on um, member states of the European <laughs> Union. This is why we had responses primarily from uh, countries part of the European Union. Mm? I, I'm not sure uh, this is what you expected as an answer, but this is my answer. <laughs> uh, uh, and for, for the reaction in general to what has has been said today. Um, first of all, if, if you allow me, I would like to thank you for the quality of uh, your presentations, uh, but also for the patient, the patient, the hurt you put uh, in, in those presentations. 
uh, all the experience and research uh, that are behind what you have been uh, reflected today, and also the philosophy uh, you have when uh, thinking about uh, human being and human being suffering uh, with the health and hurt on the so this is my first reaction. Thank you very much for, for, for your, your presentation. Uh, I would like to be short also, so I would like just to pick up a few, few things. Uh, first, uh, many of your experiences and studies referred to the importance of health determinants. Uh, the sun in Italy, uh, the family bonds, the nutrition, uh, the um, cold showers or things like that, my understanding of what you uh, presented, Anna. And uh, I would like to re remind you to under underline that health uh, determinants are uh, the first pillar for action of the, uh, of the new um, uh, initiative of the Commission, which is uh, designed as Healthier Together. Mm -hmm. So this is already part of uh, a, a commission initiative uh, since uh, end of 2020-21. I think it's very important, huh? uh, listening to what you, you mentioned. Uh, Jim, uh, Gustave and Anna, you also uh, made reference to key concepts, uh, person-centered approach, health literacy, resilience, building skills. Uh, that are concepts which have been mentioned, mentioned during uh, and in the context of the call for evidence. And this call for evidence, we are uh, in, in, in progress analyzing the results. It will take some time. We have to, to dig into uh, all the response. And uh, the, the result of this call for evidence will be used in order to support as a preparation of the communication of the Commission on a comprehensive approach uh, to mental health. Uh, Roger, you referred to broken health systems. Uh, and uh, in, in that reminds me of the uh, survey which is currently conducted uh, at the request of DG Santé by the WHO. And this survey will uh, map the capacities um, in member states of the um, national systems uh, in promoting, preventing, managing uh, mental uh, health conditions. And this, this will be, I hope, of particular interest um, to lead a more tailored discussion and analysis with the member states and to um, uh, allow uh, the, the, e, the European authorities uh, to better support uh, them in capacity building. Um, you also referred to um, something which I translated into uh, destigmatization of sick people. Uh, and I would like just to remind you of the key words of uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, when launching um, this uh, key policy initiative on, on mental health, we should take better care of each other. And for many who feel anxious and lost, appropriate, accessible, and affordable support can make all the difference. So I think that the line uh, is, is there to move uh, forward. And of course, you have many peculiarities and you have a specific approach and uh, you are there to uh, promote uh, this approach. And uh, for sure, you already also took the opportunities of past consultation in order to uh, provide the evidence, explain what you are doing, and uh, also the specificities of each of your national systems. And I would like to invite you to participate to what may, what may be the last round of consultation for st stakeholders, which will be held on the 21st of April, which is a stakeholders webinar that will be uh, held this day. 
Uh, this is on the health policy platform. You can connect to DG Santé website and you will find all the, all the, the, um, the details. Mm -hmm. because, because this is uh, very important to push uh, all the doors now. Uh, then this will be the time for the preparation of the communication, which uh, shall be delivered in June. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you have follow-up questions, then I will be happy. Yeah. Yes, thank you. My name is Ferrats. I'm from uh, ESPA, the European Federation of uh, the 1,400 medical spas that we have. Will there also be sessions? I'm coming in actually from the EU program on long COVID uh, syndrome program. Eh? Um, um, will there also be time and sessions uh, to discuss uh, the um, um, integrative mental health and uh, long COVID syndrome uh, treatment. For example, I'm specialized in, you know, that 1% of the um, European population is now at home with long COVID syndrome. Eh? And um, it, long COVID syndrome, more than 200 uh, symptoms, we've been able to bring them together in uh, about 12 um, uh, phenot phenotypes. We're now building uh, uh, a health management uh, decision support system uh, that is supported with uh, artificial intelligence to see through all these uh, biochemical pathways uh, that can lead to these uh, 200 uh, uh, symptoms. Um, I'm specialized, for example, in, um, treat in a treatment uh, when the COVID virus, the coronavirus, has followed your neural tract from your mouth, eyes, nose. These signals uh, are being processed somewhere here in the brain. So there's neural tracts going straight from your mouth, nose, uh, eyes, to, through the deep brain to those regions where these signals are being pro, pro, uh, processed. And if the co coronavirus breaks through there, breaks out there, then it destroys neural engrams here so that you, your brain has forgotten how to smell, how to taste, how to deal with uh, light impulses, how to deal with uh, stability, with uh, body temperature, heart rate, coordination, and so forth. And um, um, yeah, we, we are going to, we half, half percent, the half of that one percent <laughs> needs treatment in our medical spas to regrow these engrams. And their integrative mental health support is, is crucial uh, there. You cannot heal and regrow these neural engrams if you as a person, you are not feeling well. This is also the, the reason why uh, we have these uh, mental spas. They are linked to a hospital, linked to a research center. It's really to take a patient out of the, 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 the place where the stress factors are being, are, are coming in. Eh? If, if the patients that, that we have are, are long COVID patients, sometimes already for two, three years now that they have been sent from one doctor to another specialist to another specialist, they, they, they don't come up with a, with a, with a, with a they can't um, give a, a solution. Um, <clears throat> many, many, <laughs> People still believe that uh, it's just a matter of, that that co long COVID doesn't exist. It's just uh, you're being lazy or you are being depressed a little bit. So to start this healing process in some of these phenotypes in long COVID syndrome, the best way is to extract them out of their situation in a medical spa. Or and then I'm I'm not so I, I hear many uh, when I look at my colleague. Uh, um, from the Ayurveda, I'm sorry, yeah, from the European Ayurveda Association, and also um, connect with, with um, yeah, with indeed Asian uh, um, medicine, where that is a, that has indeed a more holistic approach. And there, the the question that came in via the chat on on, on stimulating first this this auto uh, this immune the immune system so i see I, I see many links and and vocabulary and also when i look at treatments that i that i see here i'm sure i'm sorry that uh, along the silk roads 
Uh, uh, all this knowledge has been exchanged for thousands of years. It's still there. And I think with a little bit of good, with help, uh, the, the communication, the vocabulary, I think, can be matched and we can help each other also to, uh, to sift through what is really useful and what is, what is not uh, useful. But, so is there a place for um, this discussions on, on long COVID syndrome and integrative yeah, not, mental not, health? Not to, not to really no, no. correct, not, not, not oh. now, because I, I see, I see uh, um, uh, this is 30 minutes over and I'm, I'm personally just, uh, Sir Brad asked me to step in, but what I can do uh, for you is not just suggest it to um, the interest group that's hosting this, uh, but also to the two interest groups around mental health. And then if you pass your info to, to the man beside <coughs> you there, uh, we can make sure and reach out between between us two. Yeah. Okay, not to cut you off, you. but I'm just conscious of, yeah, of, of 30 minutes over. And I think you were going to commit. Yes, thank you. Um, actually, I do have something that could address um, the things that you're saying and actually all the things that you are just mentioned here. Um, first of all, I would really like to thank our great speakers because we really had some, yeah, honestly, some really interesting inputs here from our experts. So thank you all. Um, but also for the policymakers to be here and all the representatives. Um, actually, to um, because I hear you saying, uh, Maria, that um, you would like to have more input on what can I actually do to um, bring this like to a higher level. Um, also, um, for an uh, you're you're pointing out the. The, um, the view of the European Commission. Actually, I would like to get in really shortly on something that has been developed by the MEP interest group on um, integrative medicine and health, because actually our last um, um, event was on long COVID, but it was also actually it all concerns mental health a lot. Um, so what we did after the event um, with some really representative like um, institutes from Europe, we um, um, made some proposals, research proposals that are actually now being brought up to the Commission to be decided upon because that's really something that could help us further as an integrative um, um, health yeah, field. So these are different um, research projects from, from whole Europe to, um, yeah, to maybe take, be taken into consideration for, for us because I think that could be really interesting. It's um, being brought up by the different MEPs of this interest uh, group, so maybe to have a look at it. Yes? Maria, I have just one comment. If, we, if there is some way to maintain continuity, like Veronica is here with us today, in future discussions, when it comes to matters like this, if there was this continuity so that we don't have a new person coming in from the Commission who has to start from scratch and get to grips. It's, I know it sounds a bit strange. If there is a possibility, it'd be lovely to have Veronique back with us in future meetings. I mean, if there was ever a testament and a testimony to, uh, to you, Veronica, I think that's it. Uh, continuity, I, I agree with you. Um, certainly, no doubt, we'll, we'll pass it on to to the team here, uh, and and I and I agree with you. Versus reintroducing continuously uh, the, the work you've done, um, I believe uh, I, I come in for a few minutes and I stay for a long time. Uh, I love it. So um, on behalf of of everybody involved, I feel quite cheeky in saying this, but uh, I really really want to thank you for for your time uh, and effort. Um, uh, while I'm a teetotaler myself, I do see a couple of bottles uh, of something over there. Uh, so I'm, I'm assuming everybody's encouraged to stay and, and to use. Um, um, and there's also tea and coffee if, if anybody's driving uh, or, or taking public transportation. Uh, please, be, please be mindful of your own mental health. Uh, I think when we talk about it so often, perhaps we, we, we lose our own boundaries of what that is. So um, really looking forward to the next conversation. And thank you very, very much for, for all of your time. Thank you.